this afternoon. My name is Casey Shiley. If you don't know me, I am the Youth Services Consultant. I'm primarily in charge of the Florida Library Youth Program, or FLIP, um, but I am currently wearing part of the continuing education hat uh, while we are looking to fill some positions here at library development. So I'm going to take 10 seconds to plug the fact that we are currently hiring. Uh, if you know somebody who's amazing and wants to join our amazing team, um, we would love to get a continuing education ninja in here to take the hat from, from me. And also my supervisor, Dorothy Frank, she is the other half of the current CE team. Um, so just a few housekeeping items before I turn this over to Marion and David. On your screen, you're going to see a screenshot. And if I enlarge that, um, you should see a copy of what you're seeing on your screen for your control panel. We currently have everybody muted, so that way we don't get a whole lot of background noise, especially with so many folks working from home. Um, but we do want to hear from you. So if you have a question or you want to add to the conversation, we are happy to unmute you. Feel free to click that hand raise button that you see right there and we will unmute you or you can always type in the chat and we are happy to bring up any questions that you may have. We are also on social media. We are on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter and you can find us on YouTube. And speaking of YouTube, we are recording today's webinar. So if you have to leave at any point or you just want to be able to go back and view it, it will be recorded and placed on YouTube. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Beach and Marian Dini. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Get Your LSTA Project Started. I am David Beats. I am the Grant Specialist and LTS LSTA Administrator in the Grants Department in the Bureau of Library Development. And joining me is Marion Dini, who is the Program Administrator. Good afternoon. And we're coming to you today virtually in living color in and about and from Tallahassee, Florida. And we're all glad that you're here today. And let me to say a little bit of something about the webinar today and, and the intent of the webinar. We are presenting this as a webinar for Library Services and Technology Act awardees that were funded in 2020 and for the year 2020-21 cycle for LSTA grants. Uh, this event was mentioned in your funding award letter that you have received previously and, and for some of you probably quite uh, recently. The webinar is intended for both first-time LSTA grant recipients and for those experienced with LSTA funding that want to know about some of the uh, newest uh, requirements that are uh, in the, been built into the system. It covers the basics of managing your grant using the DOS grant system. And uh, it also describes established and new grant administration requirements issued by the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the state of Florida. So that's what we're hoping that we're gonna get through today as we go through each section. If you have any burning questions that uh, you need answered and if they pertain to the section that we happen to be working on at the time, please feel free to raise your hand or put a question in the chat uh, area and we'll make sure that we get your questions answered. We're also going to reserve time at the end of the webinar so that we make sure that everybody has time to ask all your questions and to get all your questions answered as, as uh, thoroughly as possible. We're, the discussion points we're gonna be talking about, as I said, we're gonna go over the DOS grant system. We have a new web page that we have made available. In the past, this uh, whole title, the Get Your Project Started, was a PDF that we used to send out in the old days, not too long ago, we used to send you a paper copy. Then more recently, we sent a PDF attached to an email. Now this information has uh, migrated over 
to uh, a location on our web page. And throughout the discussion today, we're going to make some links available to you through the chat room. We're, you'll have a link to the DOS grant system made available. You'll have a grant, a link to the uh, Get Your Project Started web page. There's also going to be some federal rules that we're going to be discussing that we'll provide a link to. And there's a state guidelines for uh, state expenditures that's going to be shared with you as well. And I believe we're, there'll be one other document we'll be sharing. So you can keep your eyes open for those uh, links that are going to be made available in the chat. And if anybody misses out on those, we'll have an opportunity to make sure you get those at any point along the way. So without any further ado, let's uh, go ahead and move forward to the DOS grant system. And this is going to be a place where you're going to spend a lot of time as a grant manager. And uh, if you're either the, the grant manager or the director of the organization or someone that's going to be working on reports. This is the system that where you're going to be doing all that work and uh, you'll need to familiarize yourself with this web page and this uh, website for uh, operations with your grant. Uh, all the project managers and the directors should already be set up in the system unless you're someone that's relatively new. Uh, if you're a new uh, person that may have not gotten registered earlier, you should get a hold of Marion and myself. We'll make sure you're registered in the system. And then once you're registered in the system, you should be able to go to the DOS grant webpage, which you can see this on your screen currently, dosgrants.com. And over on the right-hand side, where it shows log in, as a registered individual, you should be able to go to forgot your password and click on that link and that'll give you instructions for creating a password so you can sign into the system. Okay, and there's five major items that we work with as far as working in the grants system and I'll name those five particular areas that we're going to talk about as we go through this. The application change request, which is a document that we're going to be working on first. And what we'll do as we go through this process, we're going to provide instructions for you each step of the way. So when you first need to access their application change request, almost all of you by now should have received an email from our office talking about doing an application change request if you have any changes that need to be made to your project due to the fact that perhaps the funding was at a different amount than what you originally requested in the application and through the process with the State Library Council, that funding amount may have changed or there may be other items. So when the funding changes, you're gonna have budget changes when you have budget changes, you may have uh, activity changes, anything that gets precipitated and needs to be addressed. We use this application change request process to get those changes collected. And then that allows us to move into creating your uh, grant agreement in, in the system. And that way we have up-to-date information. Now, outside of the application change request, and let me show, Marion's got that open right now, and you can see on the page, as you scroll down the page, you see different categories, you know, payments, change requests, agreements and amendments, progress reports. The next one is application change requests. And there is a uh, button on the right-hand side there that shows this particular one has, uh, I guess uh, I can't see it because I've got a message showing up here on my screen. Okay, there we go. Application change request, add application change request. That's where you're going to click, and that's where the instructions 
lead you to on the email that you received from me recently. And that when you click on that button, that's going to take you into there's four tabs in there where you can make changes that uh, apply because of changes that have happened since the application was created originally. When once we go forward from the application change requests, that that activity or that uh, function is actually going to go away. Once that's been submitted, it'll show an application change, application change request being entered and submitted and approved. And that'll, that function will remain dormant then. As you can see on this particular page, the application change request has been approved. And all you can do is view what was done. All changes after that will migrate and we can see it up at the top of the page where this uh, further up where it says change request. If you do changes after the agreement has been signed, and that would include changes that require amendments and changes that do not, they would be initiated in the change request area. Other items that we do on this grant records details page is payment requests which is up here towards very towards the very top where it says payments. For most applications or for most projects, you'll have five payments that you'll be requesting. And you can request these payments uh, individually or together, depending on if you have all your deliverables completed and the documentation to go along with it. Let's just say, for example, you had three payments ready and you have the and you've met the deliverable activities and and whatever uh, functions you had to finish to uh, support those payments, then you can put those payments all together on one request, or you can make those payment requests individually. It's really up to you. You're not held to a specific time frame or a specific payment in in a particular time frame. Uh, also, and, and I said so, and almost all or all projects are going to have five payments. In some cases, there may be some with fewer payments, and you'll know this as we go through the creation of the grant agreement. It's going to spell out how many deliverables and how many payment requests you'll be required to make to get the, the money for your activities on your project. Uh, also, I'd like to add I'd like to add one thing in here, David. Um, yes. We are trying to make sure that all, as many grant payments are made as possible before June 30, which is the end of the state's fiscal year. So we will be keeping that in mind. You will, you will have until September 30 to expend all of the funds, but we're trying to set the deliverables up so that you can request as many of your payments as possible uh, on or before June 30. Thank you, Marion. And what happens, uh, you know, you get beyond that end of the June date and everything starts getting crowded, I would say, and response to payment requests uh, timeline starts to get expanded. So as many of the payment requests as you can get in before that timeline, the better. That's always going to be better. And thank you, Marion, for bringing that up. Also on this uh, grant records details page, you have access to the contract. If you go down and look under forms and reports, once a contract has been created, as you can see on this particular example, it shows contract form executed and you can view that contract from this page. Prior to creating or having an executed contract, there's also other applications right below that you see the contract details form which is where you're going to go to look at the details of the contract prior to it being signed by yourself and by the division that's where we'll go next at when we do the change request after that you're going to find your draft uh, contract in that contract details form area for you to view and for you to either make you know amendments to and return to us it's going to be a matter of us working out you know what the details are going to be 
on the contract and therefore the name contract details form. Also right above that, you'll see uh, forms and reports or no, further up, I'm sorry, progress reports further up. Each contract's gonna be required to do two reports throughout the contract cycle. One of those is a mid-year report, which is due at the end of January, and then you'll have a final report that's gonna be due in November. Now, those reports will show up in here. Right now, you're only seeing the mid-year. Most of the time, the final report's not gonna populate in here until after the mid-year report has been, you know, came due and they've been submitted. But that's where you're going to go when you, when I send out a notice or you may get it from Marion as well, from both of us at the same time, telling you you've got a mid-year report due or a final report due, that's where you're going to go on this page to open up your report and make your, uh, entries into the data fields on on the report so and we're not going to go go deep into all these at this present time because as i mentioned earlier each step of the way you're going to get an email notification from myself or mary or the two of us together that's going to provide a notice of what's going on and instructions about what you need to do and anytime you have any doubts at any step along the way, just be sure to get a hold of Marion and I, and we'll be able to answer any questions that you might have. And David, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. Um, we do have one. When you say contract, is that the same as grant agreement? Yes, it is. Okay. And then yes, Joyce? The, de the Department of Financial, a lot of parts of the state government call it contracts. We call them grant agreements, and so if those two are, terms are used interchangeably. And it looks like Vicki was actually answering Joyce's question for her. So I think we're good, but Joyce, let me know if you need me to um, go back and ask the question, okay? Okay. At this point, I'm going to just check with my partner, Mary, and then ask her if I've missed any details on this I page. I think you've got... I think you have the major things covered. Um, the main things are, you know, um, I think David's got them covered pretty well. If you can't find something, let us know. And as someone asked about getting to this page, you will go up uh, once you get into the system and click on uh, My Grants, and then you can go, this is called the Details page. You'll click on that and get to that page, this page. If for some reason you can't get to that page, as David said, let us know. We may have to adjust some permissions. Uh, it's been, so we, we do this a lot for folks, so not a problem. Yeah, and I might add that when you open up the grants tab where Marion has the pointer right now and you, you see my grants, under most normal circumstances, unless there's some issue at that with the system, you're only going to be seeing grants that apply to your organization. Any of these examples that we may show you, you may see more information as far as like a list of grants that are available than you'll see on your own. And you know, depending on your organization, some organizations are going to see more active grants on their on their My Grants page than others. But, and then at that point, all you have to do is determine which one of those in the list is the one that you're wanting to deal with at that particular time. Your state aid and your other grants would appear on this same page as well. All the grants uh, that we deal with are operable in the grant system now. Okay. And we, also, we also have another question. Will the deliverables be entered into our dashboard? And if so, where? Okay, I'll be glad to answer that one. Um, okay. Once the, if you do not have any, uh, if you do not have an application change request and you let us know, we will then load the deliverables into the system and we will send them to you via the contract details form. We'll let you know when it is available and then you will be able to view them and see if these deliverables will work for you um, in terms of what documentation you're required to provide, or what things you are planning on doing. 
the deliverables are based upon what you you put in your application of what you were going to do and how many things you were going to do so that's where we base those deliverables uh on but it is a negotiated process it's not just here's your deliverables and you have to do this if there's something we need to adjust we will work with you we've often done this back and forth multiple times until we get everybody on the same page yeah and along with in the contracts details form there's going to be a place for you to have budget information you will have put budget information into your application change request that information is going to transfer over into the contract details form once it's been approved but it you know it still wouldn't hurt you know for you to take a look at that and make sure that that information is is uh recorded the, the way that you intended it to be and there's going to be contact information in there on that contract details form and uh, also there's going to be this the scope of work is going to be in there as well which is basically a high level description of what the project entails okay marion's showing you the tabs that are available you can see there's deliverables there's the budget there's the scope of work and then there's the contact information and all of this information will be incorporated into your grant agreement yes and the contact information is important too you know if that contact information has changed since the beginning uh, when the application was submitted we need to have that updated when you do the contract details form so that we're dealing with the most recent information as far as a contact person on the project and as we all know things change they don't stay the same for very long so that's an, another thing it's important that we keep that contact information up to date and one more question in the chat what is the deadline to submit the application change request as soon as you can get it uh, completed the sooner right. we you get it back to us the sooner we can get the uh, the scope of work and the deliverables and the uh, documentation information back to you for your review it, it's all a matter of uh, getting a, a good turnaround and keeping communication open that's the reason we ask on each, each step of the way as like when I sent you the latest email, you'll see on that email, it asks for you to contact me one way or the other, whether you're gonna have any changes or not. And as Marion described, if there's no changes, we're gonna go forward with a, you know, what we think is a reasonable set of deliverables and you'll have a chance to review that. And it'll be based on the original application. If you had an application change request, it's going to be based on what you told us in that change request. And also keep in mind that um, there, as David said, there's no specific deadline, but if you are not allowed by your local government to do anything before a contract is signed, it's up to you to get it to us and we'll turn around and get it back to you so that you can get, get it uh, approved and executed, signed by everybody and that you, so that you can then start the project. So it's really up to you uh, as to how soon you get that back to us. Yeah, and, and there may be times when you're waiting on information, you know, from people within your organization, you know, and, and you can't finish it until you get those details. And, and that's fine too. And if it's gonna be any length of time, if you just let us know that, we'd certainly appreciate that. So we know that, you know, you haven't forgotten us that, that you're just, you know, working on getting additional details. We know sometimes the bureaucracy turns slowly, so. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? Okay, well, I guess I'll go ahead and go on to the next step then. Um, what we want to introduce to you next is our brand new, literally, New to the web this week is our Get Your Project Started webpage um, on our, uh, our BLD, our grant section uh, webpage. 
uh, the website, the address is being put, will be pushed out very shortly uh, by our crack uh, uh, CE team. Um, there it is. Um, this is the page. There's also a link from our LSTA page as well. Um, now, first thing to keep in mind, we're not going to go over each and every page in on this website today. We're not. We're going to cover the highlights and major areas you need to be aware of. But we would strongly encourage you to go through these pages and look at the information, become familiar with the information. Um, also, keep in mind this is a work in progress. We have already just since we put this up on Monday identified several more things we want to go back and add to these pages as we have been working on some other things and working on preparing for this webinar. So it will be constantly, to some degree, constantly changing as we work on getting more and more information out there for you. Um, there, The first section I'm going to go ahead and start off with is the paperwork and numbers section on our website. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the project period uh, per the state, you can start your project. The project period starts on July 1, 2020, which is the start of the state's fiscal year, and ends September 30, 2021. That is the date by which all project activities must be completed, all grant expenditures, and all local matching expenditures have to be paid out by this date. Now, the starting date, as I mentioned earlier as well, that may depend upon your local policies and procedures. Some organizations will be able to start on it right now while we are in the process of getting your agreement signed. Other organizations, their local policies will not permit them to do anything related to the project, such as ordering or anything of that nature, until the grant agreement is signed. So we just may put that out there for everyone. Uh, the next section, excuse me, is our notification of grant award. This is a document that will be your official notification of the amount of money you're getting, the catalog of federal domestic assistance number, and if there's any special project related comments or instructions. We have not sent those out yet. We are, excuse me, finalizing those uh, as, we're, as I speak. And as soon as we get those done, they will be emailed out both to the uh, library director and to the project manager if that is a different person. Um, and then the other numbers, the useful numbers that are here for you, the CFDA number, the DUNS number, but of course everyone had to have a DUNS number in order to submit their application, but it's here if you need to know how to get one. And then um, also on this page is something that we are emphasizing a lot more this year with so many folks working remotely and with um, different locations and hours and stuff, we are strongly encouraging folks to get yourself, if you haven't done this already, get yourself set up for direct deposit of your grant funds. If you do sign up and get this all set up, you'll get your money often several days to a week ahead of when we can actually get a check delivered to you. Uh, the, there's a link here to the, to the form to request the um, direct deposit. Um, that form needs to be sent directly to the Department of Financial Services we do not touch the form because it has banking and account information. We don't want to touch the form. Um, <clears throat> so you need to submit that. And it takes anywhere from four to six weeks for DFS to process that. So we encourage you to do that if you haven't done that already. Uh, also, as a side note, if you are working on your state aid application, we have the same requirements in there too for state aid. So if you're doing it for one program, it will cover every program. One Sorry, thing I might might right. add to that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and don't assume uh, a lot of people have already got direct deposit authorization in place, but if it's been a while since you've done it, it might be a good idea to follow up on it and make sure that it's still, especially if you've had that account change or something like that, where you've went to a different bank account or a different bank, you're going to need to redo that authorization. And it only takes one number change anywhere along the process uh, of a direct deposit being made that it will get spit back to DFS and they will issue a paper warrant. So just keep that in mind. We, we are suggesting that you update it once a year just to be sure they have the most current information. 
<clears throat> and I'm going to turn it back over to David to cover what you must do and what you cannot do with your grant. Okay, I'm going to check. Casey, any questions at this point? Nope, you're good. Okay. All right, what you must do when you're involved in a LSTA project and you must have a grant agreement. The grant agreement is the official contract between the Department of State and your organization. The grant agreement details deadlines and other requirements that you must follow to receive grant funding. And we can't, in the next part, read it carefully before you sign. We can't emphasize that enough. The grant agreement is going to show the roles for the division and the roles in there for yourselves are going to be described as sub-grantee roles. The money from LSTA comes to us as a grantee and then we re-grant it out to you and you are the sub-grantee on these LSTA agreements. And everything in that agreement is enforced and applies for organizations that are new. If you have someone that's a finance person or even your legal representative, they're going to be interested in seeing that agreement before it's signed for the areas or the, the organizations that have had agreements in the past. Your personnel are going to be familiar with these agreements already. But everybody should read them so you know what you're required to do and all the guidelines that you're required to follow. The next section is a new section for this year, and that's a section where you, you're acknowledging federal support. When your organization issues statements, press releases, requests for proposals, bid solicitations and other documents describing your programs funded in whole or in part with federal money you have to state all of these things and it has to be a statement that goes at the bottom of the form just like the one that people have done in the past where you give credit to lsta in the division which is the next section but you have to State the percentage of the total cost of the program or project, which will be financed with federal money, and the dollar amount of federal funds for the project or program. And then any of the other funds. So there's a breakdown here on your screen, and we've got this on the screen because there's going to be an update done to that website location. So this new language will appear on the website soon. But you're gonna ask yourself as a sub-grantee receiving funding, you're required to create a funding statement acknowledging federal support. How should I word the statement and where do I find the data I need to complete it? But what you need to do is you're gonna look at your budget and your proposed budget that was on your application or if your budget was revised when you did your application change request, you're gonna look at that and you're gonna figure out which fiscal year is impacted by the federal funds and then determine the percentage and dollar amount of your project or program financed with federal government funds. Then you're gonna calculate the percentage and dollar amount of your project or program financed with state government funds. And that would be also if they're used as matching funds, which more than likely if you're reporting state funds in your budget, it's going to be in there as a matching fund entry. The percentage and dollar amount of your project or program financed with local government money. And that could also be a portion of your matching funds. That's number three. So, so far you got federal government funds, state government money, local government money, and the fourth, fourth one is the percentage and dollar amount of your project or program financed with other non-governmental money if used as matching funds. So that would be money that would come from a source, not a governmental source. 
the sum of all these should be equal to the total budget of the project that is incorporated into the grant or revised agreement. So that one's new for this year. When you get to the point where you need to have this on one of those documents that was stated above, like a press release, a request for proposal, a bid solicitation, and you need some assistance, first place you're going to want to go is go to this web page because we're going to have more details here about how to do that along with an example statement of what that would look like. And then if you still need assistance with that, you can contact Marion and myself and we'll be glad to further assist you with that. But that's new for this year. When the federal forms came out to us, and we have forms where we have to do a certification of how our how we're going to manage the project the, the cycle year for IMLS. That was a new section that was included in those forms for certification for us for this year. In addition to that, you still have to give credit to LSTA and the division. And those of you that have been in the prop in the projects in the past. You know what this is about. For those of you who are new, there's an example statement here. The acknowledgement has to include both the IMLS name and Division of Library and Information Services. And it has to be made in addition to the acknowledgement of the federal support referenced above. And the following text is an example. And a lot of you, I'm sure, have seen this at the bottom of items that have been created especially on the web with monies that came from uh, IMLS LTA, LSTA program. This project was funded under the provisions of the Library Services and Technology Act from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Florida's LSTA program is administered by the Department of State's Division of Library and Information Services. So you'll see that as a tagline on announcements, press releases, so on, that come from a program that's partially or fully funded with LSTA money. Other items such as online products, publications, and websites must link to the IMLS website and include the IMLS logo. And then we have a link there that shows you how that is done. And you can also use our logo on brochures and websites as well. So, and there's even a grantee communications kit that's available on the IMLS website. So, and you'll even see that we have some examples uh, in later years, we've had uh, one uh, bookmobile and that bookmobile actually has a sticker on it that has that statement on it. So that people that see that vehicle know where the funding came from to help make that vehicle possible. David, there is a question in the chat. If your match is in kind, do we report the calculated value of that as local funds? The answer for that is it depends. Um, thank you, Dolly. Uh, it depends if it is in kind such as such as library staff salary that is being used as match, it should probably, it, the amount should be determined and reported as local government uh, funding. If it is people in the community that are not paid, that these salaries are not paid for by the local government, then it would be non-governmental um, non funds. So it really depends. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, that's one of the reasons we have it broken down the way we do with the, the four different divisions, because you have to you have to be specific as to where the funding is coming from and, and the matching is as you can yeah, you can see here, Marion's put that page back up. You know, we're talking, you know, federal, state, 
local, other, you know, government, non-governmental, and then the total of the whole sum. But number four is the one that's anything that's not governmental, basically, not and tied really, to one. It really depends upon the source that's in your budget. You would need to look at your budget and see where those funds are actually, even if it's in kind, where were those dollar amounts that you're being used as a match? What is the source of those funds? Is it local government? library staff or county staff time, then it would be local government. Is it John Q. Public in the community and their time, which would, you're probably not going to have that, but if, if the uh, friends group is funding something for you, then that would be um, other or non-governmental funds. Now, I would add to this that the likelihood that you're going to have something in all four categories is not high there may be some cases of that but in most cases you're not going to have a statement here that has something in all four categories if you have a category that doesn't have anything you can just show it as zero percentage and zero dollars okay Okay, we ready to move on? Thanks. So. All right, next area we're gonna talk about is travel. Now, some projects are gonna involve using funds for travel or maybe matching funds in there for travel as well. Uh, what you're going to have to do when you're using travel and you're funding travel with your project, you gotta use the state amounts for travel. And as you can see here, the state amounts, 45 and a half cents and the meal rates, $6 for breakfast, 11 for lunch, 19 for dinner. Those are going to differ from the federal rates. The state law supersedes federal law in this particular case. And there are some other examples where that happens as well. So you just need to keep in mind and and yet another thing, and I'll mention it here, and I think Marion's got it elsewhere in her her presentation too, that food's another one where food is not allowed under, you know, providing food for a project is not allowed under state law at all. Even though when you go in and look at the uh, rules under the federal regulations, you'll see food is mentioned in there. So there are a couple of places where there's exceptions to the rule. And when you have those exceptions, the state gets the nod as the controlling party. Also, you have to track time. When you receive a grant, it must you must track the amount of time your employees spend working on the project. Now, we've got uh, a link there that can give you more information about that. But in a nutshell, you need to be able to account for the time you, and that includes matching time. If you're going to use time for matching, then you need to also track that. So if you've got uh, an employee that's working, you know, part of the time on the project and part of the time on other responsibilities, but the other responsibilities may include matching amounts, then you've got to track all that time. And if an individual works in more than one project, you have to separate the two projects to show hours for one project tracked and separately from the hours for the other project. What we recommend is that you keep some type of a log of the time you're spent on the project. How you do that is up to you, whether it's marking time on a calendar, tracking it as part of your timesheet, X number of hours spent on this project, X number of hours spent doing regular library duties, whatever it might be, you need to be able to keep track of that so that if you're audited, a uh, the auditor can say, okay, 50% of this person's time was charged to the project. Here's the documentation that supports that. And once again, I, and I think I did mention it, that that's at an hourly, hourly rate. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
one other item that we're going to cover in this section is evaluations. There are certain types of projects that require evaluations be done, which is basically uh, creating a survey, asking specific questions in, in specific subject matter areas that are prescribed by IMLS. When this is the case, you're going to be told about it because these are going to be included in your deliverables because we're required to make that part of the, of the uh, agreement from I, when we deal with IMLS, they want that built in to the process. So you'll know when this is required and then you're going to track that information, get the survey results, report those survey results at the end of the year. Then that information in turn is put on the federal report when we enter the details from your project from the year into the final report for IMLS. So we have a quick reference guide that's uh, tied in here where you can go and look at what those uh, activity areas are and it'll give an outline and it shows the, the questions that need to be asked on those particular evaluations. Uh, there are prescribed questions when this reference guide shows those questions. Those questions are must questions that have to be asked, but you can add other questions to the mix. As you can see here, like under library workforce, there's four questions. Those four questions have to be asked if you have a library workforce evaluation being done but you can add other questions to the survey if you have additional information that you want to gather. The important part is when you report that information to us, you need to keep that information on the required questions uh, in an area where you can report it to us and we can glean that information out and put it into the federal report. Outside of that, you don't have any restrictions on other questions or other information you want to gather with that same evaluation. But once again, I'll just reiterate that uh, you'll know when you have to do these evaluations that are required. Now, we, we do uh, encourage you to do evaluations no matter what, just to get feedback and, and to measure the success of your projects, but these are the particular ones that IMLS is going to require. Any questions? So anything? I don't see any, yeah, I don't see anything in chat right now, David. Okay, anything you want to add, Marion? No, I think you've got it well covered. Uh, as we said, we, if you are required to do evaluation questions, we will set that up to make it an easy peasy first deliverable for your grant agreement um, so that you can get some funds for your project. Uh, we do incorporate that right away. Uh, we do encourage you to be sure to be you're familiar with this so that if you need to be collecting data throughout the project that you are collecting it, that you don't get to the end of the year to write your report and we ask these questions and you go, oh, I forgot. So be aware of that. Um, and as David said, we do encourage you to evaluate your project in many different ways and tell us about that in the final report. Okay, now that we've uh, covered what you must do, now we're going to talk a little bit about things you cannot do. You cannot deny accessibility to your information. Uh, you can't discriminate on the basis of disability and programs receiving federal assistance. And your electronic and information technology resources must be accessible to people with disabilities. This is including web pages developed or purchased with LSTA funds. 
And this is tied in, once again, like I talked about earlier, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which does appear on your grant agreement or contract, reference to that is made and references to accessibility and not practicing discrimination are found throughout the grant agreement. In addition, non-compliance is uh, you're required to comply with state and federal regulations and the grant agreement. Once again, a good reason to read what you're required to comply with. And as you can see, some examples of compliance is you have to submit your reports on time. You have to return any interest that you might earn on grant funds. And you have to submit to an annual audit. So in other words, there's an audit uh, report or basically you have to have an audit. Uh, an audit is, yeah, an audit is done of your governing body. Um, if it may, if you have received, if you have gone over certain thresholds for the receipt of federal or state funds, you must have a either a state single audit and or a federal single audit done uh, for counties and cities. That's part of your annual uh, preparation of the comprehensive annual financial report. It's called CAFR. It's also called the audit. There's a lot of names for it. It's what's done at the end of your fiscal year after it has closed out. And speaking of that audit, in some cases, and I'm going to, Marion's the audit expert, but in some cases, that audit can be paid for by LSTA funds if it's over a specific limit, right, Marion? If it's over a specific limit, but it's often very hard to do because of the timing of when the audit has to be done versus the availability of the grant funds. Typically, the audit is done after the project is closed out. So you cannot set aside funds for that audit of that specific project. So it, there's a timing thing you have to be very well aware of, but audit costs are allowable as applicable. And I'd say in most cases, your finance officer is gonna be aware of yes. these conditions. So if you have a question in that regard, speak with your financial person. And submission of the audit, which there will be something showing up in the DOS grants system soon. It's still being developed. There will be a page for you to submit your audit to the department. Uh, one copy of the audit will be required to be submitted. It will cover all of the department's uh, divisions. So if you have grants with cultural or historical and, and or libraries, the, the one audit will meet all those requirements, but that's not available yet. It will be very shortly. And, and that was one last thing I wanted to mention under non-compliance that uh, anybody that fails to submit a report for an incomplete or late report or disobeys the regulations or the grant agreement, you're considered in non-compliance. And if you happen to be an organization that has agreements with multiple divisions within the Department of State, it won't matter which uh, one of those divisions you're in non-compliance with, you'll be considered non-compliant for the entire division and be subject to having uh, grant payments withheld until the non-compliance is resolved. Right. Basically, if you're in non-compliance, any funding from the department grinds to an absolute halt. So even if you thought that you were going to be late on a report, you need to make Marion and I aware of that, and we can uh, provide some guidance for you going forward from there. Mm -hmm. Any other, any questions at this point? No, David, not at this point. Okay, now Marion's going to continue talking about allowable and unallowable costs. This is, this is one of the favorite sections for everybody, right? Um, there is a lot of, there are a lot of things uh, related to your grant in terms of what may or may not be allowable. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, when we do the initial eligibility reviews for your grant, 
we look at the budgets to be sure that everything you have proposed is allowable. Um, where we often have questions come up is if you need to change your project and you want to purchase something different. That's part of the change request review process. We make sure that whatever you're proposing to purchase is allowable and applicable to your project. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. If you have any questions about can I purchase this or not, just check with us. We'll be glad to help you. There's also some documentation um, this, this section here has some of the major areas of allowable and unallowable costs where we've often had the most questions, advertising, uh, compensation, which is salaries, conferences, contributions, et cetera. I'm, again, not going to go into each one. Um, this is one of the sections where I've opened it up just so you can actually see, for example, entertainment costs. They are allowable. Uh, to pay, for example, uh, entertainers or musicians for a project, story time, et cetera. But you can't um, use the funding for amusement, and there's a whole definition there. In other words, if you just want to buy tickets for all your library users to go to the baseball game, assuming it's in person, uh, you could not do that. Uh, so just there's some of the different things. Um, within each section, we have links to where the references are. The biggest is the Electronic Code of Federal Regulations. Um, 2 CFR subpart E is the cost principle section of the Code of Federal Regulations. I have that link open here. And I'm not, again, I'm not gonna read this. If you need some uh, nighttime reading, insomnia <laughs> cures, this will definitely take care of that problem. But you can see there's a lot of things here about allowable costs, reasonable costs, and what's called allocable costs, meaning can it be allocated or a portion of the cost be allocated uh, to your project. Um, in addition to, so that's the federal guidelines on allowable costs. Then there is also, as David mentioned earlier, there is there are state requirements or straight state law or administrative rule that may further limit what's allowable or unallowable. And that is the reference guide for state expenditures. Let's see if I can get this to open up. This is what the document looks like. It's a large document. It's a PDF. You can, again, some more just light reading. Um, this is put out by the Department of Financial Services. And it covers all different types of topics. And this is one that I just happen to have open, again, as we mentioned, with the travel um, if you're doing travel reimbursements, you must use the state of Florida rates, um, which is specified in 112.061, and that's in your grant agreement. You must use the rates for meals of 6, 11, and 19, no matter what your local policies may say or the federal government may say. Um, you must use these rates, and the same thing for mileage. But you can also see here, and I'm just spinning through this very quickly, probably enough to make you seasick, um, what you need to do, what documentation you must need to do uh, to keep and everything related to, to a specific uh, expenditure on your project. Um, if you have any questions at all, again, please, please check with us. If you're not sure, we'd rather answer the question and tell you this is good, this is not so good. Um, before you actually spend the money and then run into a situation where you may have to uh, return the funds. Another big area is advertising and public relations. There are certain advertising costs that are allowable, you know, for advertising to recruit personnel or per, to recruit for services, to procure services, um, things of that nature, or program outreach specific to the project that you are implementing. Uh, what you cannot use the federal grant funds for are gene what I call generic, in quotes here, the library is a wonderful place type advertising. That is not related to a specific project. The library is good, come to the library, is something you cannot use the PR or funding on. Um, you can use it for notifying the public Again, outreach about your program, information about your program. Um, so there's a fine line in there. So again, if you have any questions, we recommend that you check with us. But we have uh, everything from pretty much A to Z. We have from advertising and public relations, 
all the way down to actually T to travel, training, marketing, et cetera, um, what we have here, and we will be adding more things to that. So you have three places to really research any purchases, this web page, the Code of Federal Regulations, as well as the reference guide for state expenditures. Any questions on the expenditures of allowable and unallowable costs at this point? I know I've just thrown a lot of information at you. One thing I would add, Marion, at uh, when you're looking at the uh, state expenditure, the references to state employees for all intents and purposes apply to you as a grantee. And when they reference the their automated system, you're going to record this in a hard copy form. Uh, this, right. For, the specific for your case. Expenditures. Right. Right. The specific case for the specific instance is related to travel. This reference guide re re references a state travel management system you will not have access to that state travel management system, but you are required to use forms and to keep that same information for any travel. And we do have links on the webpage to forms that you can use uh, in lieu of the state travel management system. Thanks, David. You're welcome. <clears throat> any, question, any other questions related to the um, to the allowable costs? Not at this time. Um, okay. And uh, just as a, a reminder, I think we'll have a few minutes at the end and we can unmute people if they want to talk instead of throw questions in the chat. So um, as okay. a thought for are, the end of the, end of the webinar. Right. Yes. And we are very close to that moment. Um, David, do you want to finish up here? Uh, I'm trying to think. Basically, as we've emphasized throughout the presentation, Marion and I pride ourselves in making ourselves available. And you can reach us. We, we are working remotely at the present time, but our telephone numbers still function as a, uh, as a uh, connection, a virtual connection to our computers and but if you need an answer if you can provide us with details in an email and send us an email that's probably going to get you a, a resolution quicker because that way we can start doing the research or whatever's required as far as looking up information to get an answer back to you so we're going to provide you with some contact information if you need assistance we're also going to put up the links on the chat if dolly may have already done that where you can get to, to the links that we've referenced throughout the presentation so here's our email addresses and our telephone numbers and at hey. this point what what we would ask you know if you've got any questions at all that you'd like to have answered at this point we'll be glad to entertain them or even comments, you know, if there's something that's on your mind, you can you can uh, go ahead and let us know about that as well. Right. At this point, Dolly, if you would unmute folks, I guess we are, um, we've reached the end of our formal presentation. We did leave a block of time to answer any questions that you may have. Um, so if you want to go ahead and open, that, open the floor up, Dolly, that would be great. Um, and we'll go from there. Thank you all. I, I think one of the, we have a lot of folks on, so maybe the best way to do it is, is let's start out with uh, some hand raises. If you want to raise okay. your hand, I'll unmute you. Um, or again, please type into the chat if you've got questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any hand raises. I'm going to go ahead and unmute everybody. Um, but of course, 
if you don't have um, a microphone, please go ahead and and uh, throw your questions into the into the uh, chat. I'm not seeing any hand raises at this point, uh, Marion and David. Okay. And in the chat as well. I just I want to make one comment at this point. This is just my thanking Dolly and Casey for putting this together technically for us today. And they've done a wonderful job with our shortage of personnel and everything. They've really been handling the ball well. So we just want to put a shout out to the two of them for helping us with this presentation today. Thank you, Dolly and Casey. I'll second that. So Marion, David, I'm not seeing questions. We do see some nice thank yous in the chat. Um, and what we might could do is just go ahead and say that the formal part of our presentation is over. Mm -hmm. um, and then if anyone wants to ask questions, we'll stay on for a few minutes before we shut things down. But I think Marion and David, you, um, you've covered your uh, very good information. And we will be making this 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 uh, presentation will be up on the web very shortly. If you have any other staff who didn't couldn't attend, we'll have that available. Yeah. We'll or if you want to go back and refer to it later. Yeah. It's always sometimes you're listening to it and you want to know if you heard it right. You can go back and check it and see. And then of course, if you have more questions, you can always get contact us. Uh, and Peter has asked, will the links in the chat be available somewhere? And I, I think, Marion, uh, you yeah, and Dave uh, are planning on sharing those. Uh, yeah, all of those links are live links on the uh, web page. Uh, if you go to the LSTA grants page uh, and then go to the, you know, getting your project started, all the different links, the CFR and the reference guide, those are all live links there. And I'll be glad to send them to you. And Peter says, thanks. And they're on their way to you in just a moment. 